Well, hello, my name is Joshua Pullen. You're at the Higher Grounds class. It is, oh, amen. You got a good class. I like that. We like feedback. We like feedback. Amen, amen. Uh, it's professional and personal development. So if this is not the class you wanted, you can leave. Or maybe you're supposed to be here, right? Maybe you accidentally walked into the class you need to be in. Uh, so that's what we're doing here. Oh, amen. Amen. Yes. So he wants you, if you have an empty seat, just to scoot in and leave the edges open. People are like, I don't want to scoot in. I don't know that person. Amen. All right, so we're going to keep talking. We're going to go ahead and get started because I like to talk. Um, and she doesn't know that she likes to talk, but I think she likes to talk as well. So we don't want to be, we don't want to be pushed for time. Uh, there's basically three main points we want, to, we want you to get out of the lesson today. Um, it's going to be kind of a story atmosphere. We're going to be telling some stories just to get the point across because I think uh, our generation, um, we, we like to connect to stories, especially in the church. We, we're inspired by stories. The Bible is full of stories for, to inspire us. So you're going to hear Kutzai's story. Um, this is Kutzai Dombo. She is going to be speaking with me today. She really likes that. Um, I'm Josh Bowen. I'm from Jacksonville. She'll tell you a little bit about herself when she gets up here. But three main, three main things. We need to have vision, yeah. right? Have vision. It's like, well, what is vision? Vision can be a lot of different things to a lot of different people. We need to have vision of one, who we are. So just to start off a basis for this class, we were saying, you know Jesus. He's Lord of your life. You have a vision of identity on who you are in Christ. Because we're talking about personal growth and personal development it's got to start with a foundation. So we're assuming from this that you have a foundation in Christ, that you know your Bible, you're living it out, you want that in your life. We're assuming you have that. So just starting off, wow, that echo. Y'all hear the echo? Is that just me? We're assuming you have that. So have vision. Have vision of who you are and have vision on where you're going. There's a, a, a famous preacher told one time, he said, if I was the devil, I wouldn't have to kill you to get what I want. I wouldn't have to literally kill you. I just have to steal your purpose. I'd have to take your vision. And if I took your vision, you're done. Someone who has no purpose, who has no vision, they're not going anywhere. Right? God wants you to have vision for who you are, how he made you. I'm about to do my part. I got to back up. The second place, second thing I want you to take home is take risks. For any kind of development to go, I like amens. For any kind of development to go, you have to take risks. Whether it's in the professional or it's in your personal life. You have to take, all the women are like, amen. Take some risk, brother. Right? You have. I heard a lot of the women like, amen. All the guys are like, amen. 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 But you have to take risks. Take risks. Have vision, take risks. And the last thing is, it's your responsibility. It's up to you. You cannot rely on anybody else but you to do it, right? And now, under the, under the umbrella that you know Jesus and you know God and you're depending on him, right? But he, he says, go. He says, go. He's not the one that's putting your feet on the floor in the morning. You have to make a conscious effort to do that. If you want to grow, it's up to you. So those three things, as we, as we tell our stories, as we do these things, look for those three things. Have vision. I have to have vision of where I'm going. I need to take risks, and it's up to me. Not you, it's up to me. Everyone say, it's up to me. It's up to me. Just to make sure, because we're not talking about in general today, oh, well, this is what the body of Christ should do. This is what, no, we're not talking about, mm. we're talking about not the neighbor, we're talking about me. What do I need to do to further myself personally and professionally? Amen? So what we're going to do is we're going to do an activity. Who loves activities? I do. Great. All right, so what I want you to do, I want you to follow me for a second. If you have something to write with, you're going to have to write some things down. Right? Uh, so shut your eyes. Let's imagine that you're, you're having a great day. Right? You're with someone that you love, and you're walking across the street, and all of a sudden, you get hit by a semi. <laughs> Don't open your eyes. I just got death looked at me. Right? And you die. Right? You're no longer living. Right now. You're no, lo- no longer living, right? And you get to see your funeral. 
you get to experience your funeral. I want you to write down what your loved ones would say about you. About your life, about your dreams, about your life. What, what you want to do, how they know you, your mom, your dad, your close brothers and sisters, what, what would they say about you and how successfully you lived? All right, bring those thoughts to a close. Now I want you to write down what your boss would say about you. Your boss. What would your boss say about you? Right, because people know you differently. You say some things you don't say to others. What would your boss say about you? And who you are, how successful you are at living, at life, fulfilling your dreams. If he only knew what your boss knew about you. The boss is too hard to think about. What, what would your coworkers say about you? just to make sure our heart's in the right place, this is what they'd say about you. I want you to be honest with yourself, right? Because part of, part, of <laughs> part, of, part of having a good vision of who you are, your identity, is that you're honest with yourself, yeah. right? So what would they say? Knowing only what you've told them and what they've seen in you, what would they say? If it's, man, he didn't do much, write that down. Or he never, he never went after his dream, write that down. He hated his job, write that down, right? I want you to be honest with these responses. What would your fellow church member say? The person you sit next to you in the pew or pew chairs. What would they say about you? If they'd say you're a great person, write that down. Be honest. And then finally, what would a teacher or a coach that you have currently now or that you've had in the past, what would, what would they say about you? Someone who's, who's ministering to you, coaching you, pulling you upward, what would they say about you? Hello, everybody. My name is Kudzai, as Josh um, so graciously introduced me. I'm actually currently with the Phoenix uh, Ministry, Singles Ministry, and, um, and I absolutely love it there. So um, I'm going to start out with a scripture, um, a scripture that really uh, provides the foundation of what it is that I'm going to share today. 
Uh, Romans 12, verse 6. For those of you who want to turn over there, I'm, I'm going to read it. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. For many years, I did not think that I had any particular gift. It was very obvious to me what other people's gifts were. But when it came to thinking about what are my gifts, I really felt like I had blinders on. It was almost like looking at a blank piece of paper and feeling like I had writer's block. Maybe I wasn't blessed with a gift. Maybe kind of God had forgotten about me. But the one thing that I know that I did have was a real a vision and a dream for my life. Amen. I wanted my life to contribute in, some, contribute in some way to other people. Vision, the act or power of anticipating that, that which will or may come to be. I was not sure how I would get there or how God would get me there, but he really did put people in my life that really helped direct me. I'm gonna share a little bit about myself so that you can kind of get a sense of where I'm going with this or what this really means. Um, I was born in the United States, but I lived in Zimbabwe from the time I was eight until I was 19. I moved back to the United States to attend college at the University of Michigan. And um, the 11 years that I lived in Zimbabwe stirred within me something that I just couldn't quite describe. I grew up seeing suffering and poverty and I remember asking myself, why had I been spared of this kind of life? How is it determined why some people are born into a life of opportunity and privilege while others aren't? Why did this happen to me? What was God doing through these experiences of my life? I, during this time, I didn't realize it, but he was really instilling a vision within me. It's not going to be the same for everyone. And at first, I wasn't sure really what was this going to look like. Was I going to head some international organization? You know, was I going to work at, start creating policies to make sure that donations were going to go to those who really needed them? Before becoming a disciple, as a female living in an African country, I felt like I needed to get a higher degree. I needed to get a higher education. Otherwise, I will not have the impact and influence um, that I wanted to have. So I made a simple decision. I'd go to medical school. Yeah. Sounds simple, right? <laughs> not so much, not so much. I became a disciple my first year, second semester of college. Wow. And I think I, it, was, it was tough juggling, um, being a disciple, studying, getting good grades, building relationships, and being in a new country. At times I didn't do well in my exams or in my tests or my papers, and I was filled with extreme amounts of doubt. I remember getting a C on a particular exam, and it rocked my world. Yeah. I remember that night going home and crying and begging God, falling on my knees and begging God, and pleading with him on behalf of the families in Africa. I held on to the vision. I remember also when I took the MCAT, I don't know, for those of you who may not know, the MCAT is, an, is a test you need to take to get into medical school. I remember my career advisor very distinctly telling me that with those scores, you will not get into medical school. So you really should think about something else, like maybe doing public health or nursing, something else. I remember leaving that meeting feeling extremely sad and discouraged and thinking, man, I have to come up with a plan B because I don't know what I'm going to do here. 
I remember my dad called me that night, and I shared with him what my guidance counselor said. He got so riled up, and he asked me, why, 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 why would you even listen? I was told by my career counselor that I would be a great piano player. I ignored him, and now I'm a successful physician. You're not going to give up. With the help of somebody believing in me, I kept at it. I pushed through all my doubts and my discouragement, and I made it to medical school. My dad reinstilled my, my vision, and that's really what helped me move forward. Pray for a vision if you don't know what your gifts are. For all of us, it's going to be something different. Get advice from people. Find people who believe in you and are willing to mentor you. Mentors can be disciples who have experience in an area of life that you're developing or people within your professional circle. It's important that they really get to know you. They commit to your development in an area that is important to you because they're the ones who are going to be able to push you when disappointment, discouragement, or fear get in the way. Also, pray for discernment because when things, don't, things aren't going to always go as you hope. God may be saying no, or he may be saying push harder. Okay? I'm going to share another scripture with you that really helped me, or that kind of represents. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 12. So it is with you, since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. All right. Fast forward. After completing my residency in OBGYN, I ended up in private practice for six years. Um, I took on the responsibility of paying off my student loans and getting some work experience. A few years ago, I was up for partnership, which meant job security, the ability to make more money, and um, decision making it within a practice. I was so torn in my heart because I felt like I was supposed to want this, right? Isn't that what you're supposed to want? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I still had this real desire to contribute to people in developing countries. I wanted to work in places where access, of health, access to health care was not a fun fundamental human right, because there are some places in the world that exist. In America, we're lucky. <laughs> I looked at a lot of different HOPE projects. A lot of the projects required that you go away for a couple of days to a week and do a lot of basic medical care, including blood pressure checks, blood sugar checks, you know, and basic primary care, which I think is great. But my skill set was women's health, mm -hmm. taking care of pregnant women, delivering babies, doing surgery. Come on. I had a passion for this. Yeah. I mean, for crying out loud, very little sleep, but I still, <laughs> I still, I still do it. <laughs> I really was committed to wanting to do this in developing, developing countries. I wanted to be able to go away for three to six months somewhere and be able to experience seeing patients go through pregnancy, delivery, doing surgery, all the different things that encompass that. I didn't want to go away for just a week. I prayed. I prayed some more. I looked at different organizations, did a little bit of research. I interviewed with an organization called Doctors Without Borders. They wanted me to commit to a nine month minimum and they would place me anywhere in the world. I got hired, but I knew that there were going to be some places that were not close to a church. I also knew that I wasn't willing to go away for more than six months. I was really concerned because my spiritual health was a priority. I wanted to be able to be close to a church. So I prayed and I fasted. What could I do? I would make a request. I would tell them that I was only willing to go away for six months and see what they said. I remember with such trepidation, or not trepidation, but like apprehension is a better word. Apprehension, surrender, I sent out the email. Checked my inbox 24 hours later. There was an email back. I clicked on open. And they said, yes, we will reduce the time commitment for you. I, I knew that 
if they had said no, it wasn't going to be God's will. And I was willing to accept that. The second prayer, I want a place where there's a church. I ended up being stationed in Sri Lanka as their head gynecologist for a hospital in the North region. I had gotten a lot of advice from a mentor of mine who is also a disciple and uh, who is also an OBGYN. Not everybody was on board with me going. Some people didn't feel like it was a good idea. Some people thought it was a great idea. This mentor of mine advised me that it would be a great opportunity, not only for me to be able to live out my dream, because I may not ever be able to get ex- to experience that. I may get married and have kids, and you know what? How would I be able to do that? Or um, he also said, I could be able to go and learn and glean off of all the experience that I have and be able to bring it back to hope. It's an, it, was, it, w- it could be an opportunity to elevate God's kingdom and build up a part of his church. With important people in my life believing in me, I was propelled into action. I took a risk saying no to a higher paycheck and traveling to a foreign country where I didn't know anybody, had no family or friends. I chose to do this in order to pursue my dream and serve others. It doesn't have to be in medicine. Your vision is your vision. It can be in any area of your life. I really, once I, once I had gotten the placement, I really wanted to set myself up for success spiritually. I called the leaders in Sri Lanka. Oh, by the way, there was a church there. <laughs> I called the leaders in Sri Lanka and I told them that I was coming. I made my friends in, well, I was in New Jersey at the time, make sure that they could commit to Skype times, phone call times, email times, And I also created a spiritual treasure chest. And with that, I'll describe that just a little. I asked, instead of having a, when I left, I didn't want any goodbye gifts. I didn't want any, anything like that. I wanted everybody to write their favorite scripture in a card and explain to me why that was. Because I knew that there were going to be times where I may not be, I wouldn't be at church. I wouldn't be around the fellowship. But I wanted to know that I had my spiritual treasure chest. And any time I could just pull out a card, read it, and know that people were with me. And God was with me when it was hard. Um, God's plan was ultimately fulfilled. I ended up in Sri Lanka for only three months. <laughs> I learned a lot about myself, as well as running a project in a third world country. Recently, um, Hope just started a women's health program in Cambodia. And I was asked to go over and train the local staff. Yes. Amen to being able to build up God's kingdom. Sometimes we think we have to pick and choose. Either I pursue my profession or my passion with zeal, or I pursue God's kingdom and my spiritual walk. Be creative. Look at a situation and see how you can make it work all the way around. Know what your limits are. Think of what your spiritual needs may be. How can a situation benefit me professionally, and what can I also put into place to make sure that spiritual needs are met? All right, I have another scripture. All right, John 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Even though I was able to develop professionally, there was still a part of me that needed to develop personally. After coming back from Sri Lanka, I moved to Arizona, and that's where I started working full time. I got the opportunity to expand my horizons. I participated in a personal development program that pushed me further out of my comfort zone to take a risk I never in a million years could have thought my, could see myself taking. As I said, OBGYN, I don't get much sleep. But on average, I work sometimes on a good week, it's 60 hours. On a bad week, it's close to 110. For me, of course, it was an excuse to do anything else. There were always the excuse to do anything taxing outside of work or church is that I don't have the time. (laughs) I learned, though, that that's exactly what that was, an excuse, or at least a very limiting conversation that I had with myself. 
I found myself exploring the things that I wanted to do in my life and what had stopped me from achieving some of these things that I wanted. Circling back, I always came back to being able to, wanting to be able to contribute in some way to people in developing countries. But I was working here in the United States. Did this mean I had to go somewhere else? Did I have to travel to another country? Well, I started with a vision, empowerment, self-sufficiency, peace, and love for women and children in developing countries. I just started talking to everyone and anyone who would listen to me. <laughs> How could I do something to make a difference while working here in the United States? Very soon, I had a team of people dedicated to this vision, both locally, in other states, and also in other countries. I was able to create a nonprofit organization to empower women and children in poverty-stricken countries. Our first project is in Zimbabwe, and we have been able to raise enough money to provide sewing machines for a community of 1,000, wow. um, along with the supplies that they need. They will be sewing school uniforms for children in the community since a lot of their parents have to travel four hours away to do this. The expectation is that this community will generate income to become self-sufficient, to be able to um, provide for their needs for farming and, and, and whatever it is that will help them survive so that they don't have to rely on funds from family members who are overseas, or the government, or from humanitarian aid. I wanted them to be able to feel like they could do something for themselves. They have a 70% poverty rate and 70% unemployment rate in this particular community. With the help of a team, God allowed me still to contribute to others while working here in the US. I've already been asked by some people in Arizona to help start a project in Cameroon. <laughs> I don't know how, but I don't know. I'm not gonna let that stop me. I dare each and every one of you to take a risk. Since God has chosen you and has given you a charge to bear fruit, God wants us to take action that will help us bear fruit because he's waiting to give us whatever we ask in his name. What I have shared with you today is my story, but I want you to leave this class knowing that in whatever situation or circumstance that you are, whatever you do day to day, you can have a vision, take risks, and do great things for his kingdom. Amen. Isn't that an amazing story? Yeah. You know, your story could be just as amazing. God made you to have an amazing story. He designed you that way. She had a vision and she went after it. Is it a risk to leave a country that is sufficient, that you feel comfortable in, to go to another country that is just not? Right? To not choose a job that's going to give you a lot of income, to get you the car, to get you the house, maybe to get you the husband? Right? And to, to go to another country, it's a risk. But it pays off. Amen. It pays off, maybe not financially in the flesh, but in the spirit where it matters. It's a cost worth cashing in on. So I have a question. If you can come back up, because there's a microphone here. I have a question for you. Quick question. So if, if you'd have seen, like right now, if there was a job description about who you were, right, to fit you right now, written out, now you go online to Google and Monster and like job description, then your job description popped up and you saw it 10 years ago as you, would you think you fit that job description right now? Oh, absolutely not. What was that? No. Okay. That was an absolutely not. <laughs> but you're here. Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And how did you get here? God. So, bam. God? Yeah. Amen. And insert everything she just said. Yeah. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Job descriptions can look very intimidating, yeah. right? Your future can look very intimidating. It can strike a lot of fear in you, right? For me, a, 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 passion, of mine, a passion of mine is to join the FBI, right? They have some big words on those applications. <laughs> You're like, Whoa, yeah, uh-huh, uh -huh. do I fit that? I think I fit that. God, am I being honest with myself? Okay. You can't let that stop you from moving forward. Right? God didn't instill in you fear. He didn't. He didn't give you fear. When you, when you look at love, right, the 1 Corinthians 13, love, fear is not in there. It's just not. It's actually not, it's everything that is not God is fear. He didn't give you anxiety. Love is anxiety. No, don't have that. But go after your dream. 
We have to go after it. She went after it. If she didn't go after it, she wouldn't be here. She's speaking today because she saw vision and she didn't let anyone say no. Right. Even when they did say no. Sometimes we get, whoop, is that a no? Well, God, is that you? Is that you, God? Did you say no? Or if we get a yes, we're like, oh, that must be God because it's an open door. But the open door has nothing to do with your vision. Just because the door opens doesn't mean God opened it. There are a lot of successful sinners in the world, a lot of successful people who don't know Jesus in the world. Are those open doors? Do you think God's opened them? He could be. Right? God has a plan for everyone. He has a plan and a purpose. We have to have that vision to go after God's plan for our lives. So sometimes we can come into classes like this and we have, all right, Josh, give me a one, two, three point about how to be a better me. Right? And if I did that, I'd be doing you a disservice. Because a better me is, what, 100 people right now? And those points aren't going to fit everyone the same. Right. I can't say, well, well, you need to do this. You need to go online. You need to look at jobs and find the thing that fits you best. Or you need to go and study this and be better at this. You know, you can't do that. But what we can give you is vision. Right. You have to find that vision for yourself. Right? right? So the three points we hit. Let's talk, about, let's talk about identity and vision. Flip to Psalms 139. 139. I talk quickly, so if I mumble and you don't understand, just yell at me. Psalm 139. I was going over my lesson this morning. I just got a fire inside of me. I got a lot to say. I hope it comes all out clearly. So I'll go to verse 13 through 16. I'm going to read it for you. It says, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. God knew you before you were born. He created you with a purpose, right. right? It's a famous saying. He created you on purpose, for a purpose. Right? Y'all know that? You're like, thanks, yeah, it's a great motivational thing. It's true. You have to have that identity. I am made for a purpose. Sometimes we think we have our gifts, and we're like, oh, well, this gift isn't spiritual. How can I use this for the kingdom? How can I use mowing the grass for a kingdom? How can I use being in a call center for the kingdom? Right? Only spiritual gifts are the ones that, you know, are at spiritual places, like the church building. And it's a lie from hell. God made the church perfectly. Do y'all believe that? Yes. Flip through 1 Corinthians 12. Yeah. And you can see how perfectly he created. The eye can't say to the ear that just because I'm not an eye, I don't want to be part of this body anymore. It doesn't make you not part of the body. It just means you're confused and you need to realize you're an ear. And go be a great ear. My hand can't say to my foot, I don't want to be a hand. I want to be a foot. So I, I don't want to be part of the body. Then No, no, no. You're created as a hand. Go be the best hand you can be. Why? Because God created you to do that. Yeah. He created your gift, your desires, your ambitions to go completely be you for God's kingdom. Right. We don't want to get that confused because we can use spiritual gifts in an unspiritual way. Sure. And we can use non-spiritual gifts in a spiritual way. Come on. Right? We could say, oh, well, that guy's got it all together because he's preaching on stage. God just loves him. No. Yeah. no. <laughs> Absolutely not. You've got to get a higher vision of yourself. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the gifts he put in you and the passions he put in you are for you? I don't want to go to Africa and be a doctor. <laughs> That's not me. That's good. Time. That's her. And she's doing it well. And she is serving the Lord Amen. as a doctor. Awesome. I know some lawyers that are serving God as a lawyer, but they're all liars. They're serving God as a lawyer. Right? They have the spirit of God in them and they are working out their salvation with fear and trembling, but they're working it out. They're going after their vision, their dream, not someone else's dream and vision. Don't go after my vision. I like to talk. Some people don't like talkers. 
Some people in this room like, I wish he'd talk less. Right? And I'm okay with that. Because there's other people like me who like to talk who are different than me. They're going to reach out to those people. It's not my job to convert everybody. It's my job to be my part of the body and do what I can to do what God put on my heart in the situation that I am in. Well, I can't serve the Lord as a single mom. It's a lie from the the devil. Are you serious? Well, I've sinned too much. I can't serve God anymore. No no divorced person can serve the Lord. Those are all lies. You have to have a higher vision for yourself. And you can't blame others for it. Because there's a lot of negative in the world. You've got to separate yourself from the negative people in the world. And you've got to connect yourself with the, the truth, with the body that says you can and you will. Because what is impossible for man is possible with God. We have to believe that. We have to have that vision to even begin going forward to discover our passions. We have to have that vision of who I am or we get lost in our visions and our passions, right? I could be a great salesman. I could. I could get lost and I could ride the ladder all the way up and just forget God completely. Why? Because I have everything. That's why it's so difficult to be a Christian in America because we have everything. Oh, but I go through persecution. You don't know what persecution is sometimes. Right? Not having enough gas for your car is not persecution. (laughs) That means you spent too much money last week going out to eat. Because you think you deserve it. We think we deserve our health care. When 90% of the world doesn't even know what health care is. Right? So we have to have a higher vision of what God is doing in our nation, in our households, in our lives, so that we can grow personally. First personally, and then professionally. Then we can take that vision of who we are, and we can take it to the workplace. And we can be professionals in the workplace. And we can grow not only ourselves, but everyone around us because it's infectious. The word of God is infectious. I have other points. Let's continue. One of the things that I love about the Bible is he uses stories that relate to us. Right? So if you ever have that gift, you're like, man, God can't use this. I mean, how, how is God going to be able to use this? Right? Just read Esther. Just read Esther. Some people compare it to a beauty contest. She saved the nation because she was faithful. She took a risk with her life, stepping in front of the Pharaoh. Pharaoh, king, what was he? That guy who could have taken her life. She's like, no, I'm, I'm going to do it. It's on my heart. I have a vision of God. I have a vision of who I am. I know what I'm doing. I've calculated the risk. It's going to take my life maybe, but I'm going to do it because this is God's purpose for me. I'm going after it. And she ended up saving the nation. Know where she wouldn't be if she didn't do that? Anywhere but this book. But she's there to inspire those who think they have nothing. When they really have a jewel from heaven that God created for them. Go do it. Go have it. We have to take risks. I'm going to get to this story. I wanted to go through a couple of these things because I have a story for you. It's in Joseph. Just a little, little feeder. The story of Joseph. But we have to take risks. Who knows where the richest place in the world is? Richest place in the world. Give me a guess. Dubai. It's not Dubai. And there's places in Dubai that are rich. Singapore. It's not Singapore. There's places in Singapore that are rich. It's the graveyard. The richest place in the world is the graveyard. So much potential. So many inventions. So much fruit that never happened because they didn't do anything. Who's going to want this invention? I'm not good enough. I'm not going to go do that. I I can't make that. No one's going to buy this. Who wants what I have? I mean, who am I really? And they die and nothing is done with their life. And all these things that are inside them, like fueling them to go and do something, they die with it and no one knows about it. From a child, I was making just a list of things, like inventions. Not, uh, inventions as children? Inventions, right? I had a fear. This is like I was five. My mother was a nurse. And I had a fear that the AIDS epidemic was big. And I, th- I thought she was going to get stabbed by a needle. She was going to get AIDS and die, right? I was a child, right? And it's still possible. So I, I wrote in my book a retractable needle that when you stab somebody, 
you press this button and it retracts and it goes in this place where she can't get stabbed and it's never happened. So you never take it out of her skin, just poof, right? You know what they use now? Yeah. Yeah. I was five. <laughs> I missed my calling. <laughs> I could have been a millionaire, a retractable knitter because I love my mother. God uses those things. He uses them. I'm not taking credit for the needle. And I want you to look at me like, oh, wow, he's got such vision. No, it was just the thought to me. Wow. To hear that, that's the death of me. It was just a thought. It was just a concept that's not important. And we think about our, our lives that way. You know, if you never ask for a raise, you may never get one. I was a manager, right? I ran, I ran a company. If you never asked me for a raise, I may not give it to you. But the people who asked for it, guess what? It's biblical. <laughs> it's biblical. Come on. Ask for whatever you want in my name and I what? Give it to you. Go ahead and ask. Ask, seek, knock, and the door will be opened. We have to go and ask God and go and be part of our lives. You are the main person in your life. You. You have to start walking it out. Take some risks. If you want to grow, the first thing you do is take a risk, right? What's that song in 2000? Uh, what's it called? I wrote it down just so I wouldn't forget it. I don't know where I wrote it. Um, what's it called where it's, uh, sing it. It's the guy that speaks, uh, the graduation song. Remember the graduation song? Do one thing every day that scares you. You remember that? No. no? You win some, it's a risk. Sometimes you fail, right? But in the song, he said, do one thing every day that scares you. Why? Because it keeps you on the edge. It doesn't make you complacent with what God gave you. Don't feel like God can't use you. He can use you so good. If he can use people like David, right? Slinging a stone, we're going to get to him. That was his gift. He had a sling and a stone. And he knew how to, to operate sheep. Yeah, fit for a king. Vision. Vision of what God sees in you and how you can move forward. That's how you grow. But, but Josh, what if I fail? What if I fail? You may. Failure's good. Failure can be real good. Right? You ever seen a football team fail and the next year come back and just like, bah, knock them out of the water? Why? Because they were inspired. They used their failures as fuel to move forward. It's okay to fail. If you fail, fail forward. <laughs> Don't fail backwards. Yeah. Don't fail and quit. Fail forward. Yeah. I love listening to Les Brown. Les Brown, motivational speaker. Oh, yeah. Come on, somebody. Les Brown is legit. <laughs> Hip-hop preacher, E.T. Thank God it's Monday. Anybody? No. Oh, you will now. He's legit too. <laughs> Take your Mondays back. He's like, thank God it's Monday. Own it. Every day is your life. It's yours. Go after it. Go after it. He says that Liz said, if, if you fall, fall on your back. Because if you can see up, you can get up. Get up. Get up and go get it. Go forward. That's grace. Pick a scripture. I don't have to open it up for that. God gave grace to a lot of men and a lot of women in the Bible after their failures. And then once they failed, he's like, mm, I'm going to call you now. Because now you know it's me pushing you forward. And let's go. Let's go forward. Right? Sometimes you have to have a rip in the muscle for it to grow. That's how you work out. When you pump iron, your muscle rips. It tears. So you're literally you're tearing your body. And when it heals, it gets stronger. That's how you get bigger. Sometimes we have to be cut to grow. God is good at mending those things together. But we have to move forward. Have to move forward. Don't be complacent with your talents. Don't be complacent with what God gave you. I love what you said. You have to have a body of believers around you to support you. Sometimes the first thing you just need to do is speak it out loud. Say it to somebody. And then they can hold you accountable. Say it to someone who cares. Right? Don't say it to a bum on the street. If you need to practice, go do that. <laughs> I've done that before. I've walked up, being nervous about a talk. I was like, hey, man, I want to talk to you. Fail forward. Right? But practice it out and then go tell someone who cares about you. So they can, they can be in your life. Yeah. And then to have a good vision for yourself, right? That vision of yourself. Let them mold you. 
Be moldable. I thought I was an open person, right? I'm a dude. All the women are like, yeah, well, all dudes think they're open. <laughs> they don't know what open is, right? And then I, I walk with this girl. We're, we're walking on the pier. It wasn't the beach. We're walking on the pier. She's like, Josh, I've known you for two years, and I've known this other guy for two days, and I feel closer to him than I am to you. And I could have been offended, and I could have said, you're just in love with me, and I could have just brushed it off, <laughs> right? I could have just knocked it away like it was nothing. But, but the Bible says that we need to grow from situations like that. Right? The Word of God is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So we'll be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That means we got to look for correction. We should want it. We should hunger for it. We should hunger for a rebuke. When a rebuke comes, eat it. You rebuked me? Thank you. Where can I grow? How can I be more like God? Because no, no, it's not in love in 1 Corinthians 13. Pride. Blessed are the prideful. It's not in Matthew either. For they shall inherit nothing. But think they have everything. She's like, brother, you're not open. I was like, yes, I am. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. Look how happy I am. Right? I have tears every now and then. She's like, no, this is, this is 10 minutes. Hey, man, that's good for me. I had to change my view of open. Sometimes you have to redefine things in your life. Sometimes your vision is only for a stage. And then you have to push forward, and it's got to mature. And you have to step forward. Yesterday's successes aren't good enough for today. Yesterday's vision, if it's not in God, is definitely not good enough for today. But it needs to grow. And you need to become stronger. As you grow, you need to become stronger. If people see you today, like from a year ago, and they say, oh, you're just the same old person, be offended. I'm telling you, be offended. Take that as a slap in the face. Not because they're rude, but because you need to grow. Daily, you need to grow. You need to be a different person tomorrow than you were today. Personally, that's how you grow. I want to grow. I want to move forward. I have to take risks to that, and I have to be open to what truth is about me. If I'm prideful, I need someone to tell me I'm prideful and I need to receive it. Mm -hmm. right, so it's hard to get men sometimes because we're prideful. Right. I don't need anything. I'm not prideful. I told someone like, hey, do you have a problem with pride? And I was like, no, I don't have a problem with pride. But because I said that, I probably have a problem with pride. <laughs> Eating my words, right? So be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. We're gonna go to Joseph, right? Joseph. Joseph went through different stages. Just follow me because I have 10 minutes. I told you I had a lot to say. <laughs> Joseph. Oh, Joseph. Who likes Joseph in the Bible? Come on. If you didn't raise your hand, it's because you haven't read the story. Because you like Joseph, right? Joseph was born into a family that was chosen by God. Blessed is he, right? Provided for. He was provided for. He had a lot of brothers. He had a lot of brothers. Back in that day, that was like gold. He had a lot of men. I mean, more people could work and build families and support each other. We could rely on each other. It's kind of like the church today. We rely on each other, right? But he, had, he was born to this. He was the favorite even. Who's the youngest in the room? Youngest in their family? You can relate to Joseph. <laughs> You're the favorite, right? The youngest are typically the favorites, right? So he got this coat of many colors and his brothers got jealous. And he went from being in the chosen family of God to being sold into slavery. He got spared his life, right, because they wanted to kill him, but he got sold into slavery. Where did his vision go? Because remember, he had a vision. He had a dream. And then he, what do you think he has now? Sometimes we can let those circumstances in our life steal our vision and our dream. Like, well, I guess, it's, I guess it's not for me, God. I guess I'm just not supposed to ever be married because I can't hold a girlfriend or boyfriend. I guess I'm not supposed to get this job because every time I ask for it, they pick someone else. I guess I'll just quit trying. God, he tells us not to give up. He says, in Hebrews, it says, we are not of those kind who back down and are destroyed, but those who have faith and they move forward. We don't back down 
from adversity. We don't back down from challenge, from things that look like they're not going our way anymore. We have to move forward. So what I love about Joseph is he fully became himself where he was. And then he came to the second stage of his life. He was put into slavery by his brothers. Third stage, he was put in charge of all the slaves. <laughs> Used what he had in the situation that he was in, fully moved forward. Using everything that he had, I'm going to make the best of where I'm at. I'm going to go forward. Why? Because I had a dream and a vision. I don't know what God's doing. We, who can relate to that? Prayers. I don't, God, I don't know what you're doing. But I'm going to be faithful. We live by faith and not by sight. Right? right? I got to be faithful, Lord. Kept going. Then he's put in Potiphar's house, right? Now he's over all the slaves, even over his master's household, even his master's wife. He says, you can't touch her. And then what happens to him next? She bamboozled him. And he's in jail again, right? But not like a puny jail. He's in prison, like the country, right? Where, where Pharaoh's prisoners go. He's there now. But you think, where's his vision again? Like, God, what are you doing now? What are you doing now, God? So what does he do? He continues on with the gifts he's given. He interprets dreams. Sometimes we have gifts and talents, but we never hone them into skills. Just because you have a gift and a talent to be an athlete does not make you an athlete. What makes you an athlete is if you take that gift and talent that God gave you, and you make it into a skill. And then you can be something great for the kingdom. Right, let's look at David. Slinging a stone. Out there doing nothing, just doing David. Killed a lion. No one knows, no one cares. Killed a bear. The bear would have killed him, no one would have known. Right, but he's getting good at this sling thing, right? Now he sees it across the way. Maybe even he goes after it, like, ah, bam, long distance. But he got good at that sling, didn't he? And then when the time comes, what did God do? There's a bear. There's a bear coming up to Israel. There's a lion at the gate of Israel. And he's like, guys, what's up? I got a sling and a stone. Y'all got swords. Why y'all backing down? God's on our side. And he did what he was good at. He couldn't even wear the armor. How pitiful. The armor held him back. Don't fit into a mold of the world either. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Let him guide you. Sometimes I like to fit into this Christian mold or this, this salesman mold or, or this you know, entrepreneur mold and we, we get away from God. Let God use you fully who you are. I'm not saying a mold is bad, but if it takes you away from God's vision for your life, get out of it. Get out of it and move forward. And he slayed the giant. He was faithful what God gave him to do. How can that be a spiritual gift? He saved the people of Israel with a sling and a stone because he was faithful with it. He may not even known God at the time when he had the sling and the stone, but he was faithful with it and he moved forward. Joseph had a, a gift of interpreting dreams, interpreted two dreams was in jail, right? And then what'd they do? They forgot about him. He got out and the guy lived and she forgot about him. He was there for what, seven, 10 more years? I hope that's right. It's recorded, so I'm in trouble now. <laughs> right? And then Pharaoh's got a dream. And Joseph's in charge of the whole jail now, right? He's running the prisoners in the jail. It's like, Pharaoh had a dream. Everyone's up in shambles. What's going on? And this guy remembers Joseph and that gift. He says, interpret my dream. And then he goes to his next stage as second in command over all of Egypt. Who could have thought? Who could have thought some nobody sold into slavery was going to be second in command over all Egypt? God had a vision for that man. And he stayed faithful to God, used his gifts, the gifts that he made for him, and progressed forward. And God used him in a very tangible way for his kingdom. For his kingdom. It's a beautiful story. So how do we grow professionally and personally? We've got to have a vision. God's vision for us. We call that identity. You have to know who you are in Christ and walked that vision out. She had a vision for her life. And it was scary. And she didn't know maybe where it was going next. God doesn't promise you tomorrow. He doesn't. Know what he does promise you? Forever. Forever he promises you. 
I, I mentioned E.T., Eric Thomas, the hip-hop preacher. He's famous for going around the world, so I've got to quote him just in case. Right? He says, be allergic to average. <laughs> average is killing you. You are not average because you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Be allergic. If you feel average coming on, just start sneezing. <laughs> Do you know why? Because people will bless you. <laughs> Come on. You want a blessing, just start sneezing. Right? But don't do that. Go out. Be great. Go be it. So we have a couple more minutes, I hope, left. So watch, what I want you to do. Oh, wait, yeah, we're on the time. To end, I want you to close your eyes again. All right? You're holding hands with your loved one. You're walking across that street. Semi hits you. You go to your funeral, but this time you've lived your life fully in faith of the Lord. And you've gone after your, your treasure. You've gone after your gifts. You've gone after your passions. What are people saying about you now? I want you to write those down. Write down what they're saying about you. Even if it's in the future, even if it hasn't happened yet, what are they saying about you right now? Go ahead and write them down. What's your loved ones saying about you? Your kids, what are they saying about you? Your brother and your sister, what are they saying about you? What's your boss now saying about you? Your coworkers, your pastor. Just jot them down. That's your vision. That's what you need to become. That's what you need to go after. Go after that. That's your homework. Your homework is go be you because God created you to be in his kingdom as you. Go be everything you are. Amen. Success is a bunch of little things done well. Go do them well and go be successful. Amen. Amen.